This talk is called Heading for Financial Extinction. And uh, we will be covering how the finance system works and uh, currently what is going wrong with it with regards to our environment. So uh, Liam, would you, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Yeah, thank you, um, Vince. Lovely to be here today. I uh, got involved with Extinction Rebellion uh, at the end of 2018. I went to the bridge um, uh, closure, the bridge blockades back in uh, November of 2018. Didn't really get involved, but I went to a Heading for Extinction talk in February um, of 2019. And then a couple of weeks later, I was um, throwing blood outside Downing Street. Um, and then, um, yeah, just kind of went from there. Really, uh, 2019 was just a you know roller coaster year of being involved with Extinction Rebellion, and um, yeah, I was actually involved in bringing um, the skateboard ramp onto Waterloo Bridge, which was uh, quite a serendipitous moment when we were talking the other day because that was um, you know when you, it was quite a big thing for you and. Uh, how Waterloo Bridge was quite an important moment for you last year and get involved with um, Extinction Rebellion yourself. This was a pivotal moment for me because I spent um, the last 10 years of my life working in the finance industry. Um, and um, uh, I, I've been working in sort of the kind of responsible ethical end of the finance industry. Um, and, you know, I thought I was, you know, do, doing my bit, I was doing a good thing um, until one day I uh, unfortunately took my lunch break, walked across Waterloo Bridge and uh, discovered there was a protest going on. Um, and, uh, you know, um, at, at that time, I, I didn't necessarily have the most time for protesters. Um, so I, I sort of uh, brushed it aside. Um, but, but I found myself wanting to go back the next day and got talking to some people and basically um, very quickly my kind of idea of, uh, of, of what was the right thing to do very much uh, kind of unraveled. And I find myself here now uh, almost a year later doing a webinar um, titled Heading for Financial Extinction, which is definitely not, not where I would have expected and definitely wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for uh, Liam putting that skate ramp up on Wolfsley Bridge. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely, when you told me that, it was like just such a powerful example of, of um, uh, you know, and, and, and the argument for like being there um, and, and disrupting the public in the way that we did back in April and your kind of um, story of how that deeply affected you was such a great example um, of uh, holding out that kind of theory that, that, that we were disrupting um, people in their own city because we were kind of trying to make this argument that actually this problem actually involved them that it wasn't activists doing something to some other people that it, um, that yeah it, act, it actively um, affected them and I suppose this session today um, really we want to sort of under to help me I've been thinking a lot I suppose as we all have over the the, the, the last sort of few weeks and months about um, the financial system um, and how uh, the, the current crisis that we're going through is also connected to, to the climate crisis um, and I suppose this session is about how the finance system in particular is heavily involved with um, you know both of those crises and um, I suppose you're going to help us understand a little bit more about that today. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I'm just a normal person, I'm an electrician, go to work every day um, and just want to find out a little bit more about how the finance, you know, what is it? Um, so yeah, so what is the financial system um, and, 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 and what is its purpose really? My experience has been that, you know, I had the benefit of um, you know, for better or worse, sort of selling my soul to the to the finance system for for ten years, and um, what that did give me was a lot of knowledge and understanding of how it works. So then, when I've come uh, on the inside within XR, uh, you know, it's, it's it's much clearer to me, you know, where we can have an impact. But I think for a lot of people, the, the finance system is is very com very complex and very opaque, and it sort of hides behind a lot of that complexity. So. We're going to try and do our best to explain it. We won't go into a massive amount of detail, but we're really just setting the stage here for, um, for what's going to come for the next week. So, so I think the first question um, that, that, that we often actually skip out is just what is the finance system? Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to share my screen, which is uh, going to explain to you how, how I see it. 
so, so I think the first thing to understand when we talk about finance is like, what's the difference between finance and economics? We often talk about those things in the same breath. Um, and and the, I think the main distinction here is when we talk about economics, talk about economic policy, we're talking about things that are set by the government, uh, you know, setting the rules of the game for, for the economy, right? That's things like reg regulation, tax, interest rates, subsidies, that kind of thing. And then of course there's public investment the government does, that's investment into things like the NHS or anything that, you know, that, that the government owns. Um, but the financial system is specifically um, the, the, the allocation of investments and the movement of capital in the privately owned part of the economy. Um, and and, and it, it's an important distinction because when we, when we think about, um, let's say like things like targeting carbon neutrality by 2025, um, we very much like focus on the government because we say, okay, the government should should be delivering on that on that outcome for us. But in reality, actually, all a lot of the work to make that happen would actually have to happen within the financial system, because um, the government doesn't own the electricity network in the UK. It's owned by a bunch of companies, and so the decisions on what you know in any given year how much renewables versus how much fossil fuels. Um, uh, in terms of the energy supply get built, that's made by investors who are making decisions on where to invest into companies. And you know, similar with all sorts of things like uh, you know how quickly the 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 um, the, the vehicle fleet electrifies. Um, and um, and so and so, what this means is is that you know, financial system is incredibly important in understand in in influencing what really happens in um, in the real world around us. And, and, and to my mind, this, this, whenever we think about the financial system, we always have to keep in mind that it's basically serving two purposes or two responsibilities. One is, is it has its purpose for savers. So anyone who saved money, they, they, you know, and they put it in their pension or they personally invest it or, or whatever, you know, they, they want to see their savings grow. And, and investing capital that has been saved is one of the main functions of the financial system. Um, and we'll talk about that responsibility later. But but the other responsibility is to society is to to invest and create an economy that we actually want to live in. And I think that part that responsibility has has really been left behind. And you know the financial system kind of sees themselves as quite separate, often from the outcomes. Um, so so that is broadly sort of the role of the financial system and where it sits in um, in in our broader kind of economic questions. We're going to talk a little bit, like you say, a little bit more about um, where the responsibility lies in a little bit more detail. Um, so I suppose the next question is, where, what role is um, finance playing in, our, in the climate crisis um, and also the social crisis that we've been experiencing with COVID-19 um, over the last few weeks and months? Is it's playing an absolutely massive role. Um, and um, what, what I'm going to do is, is try and show you a few charts just to kind of like capture uh, the stakes um, uh, for, for the financial system and, and also a little bit, also a little bit of the madness. You know, a lot of us will be familiar with these sort of emissions pathways, but I, I don't think we should ever kind of, you know, we're, we're in the midst of the coronavirus crisis, but it's important not to forget that that, that we're in the middle of a much deeper, much longer, um, and, and ultimately much more destructive crisis, which is climate crisis. And, and so we have this very radical shift that we need to make as a society. And we're still gonna have to make it after coronavirus. You know, we'll have this you know, short-term dip in emissions, but the problem isn't going away. Um, and so, as we said before, it's actually investment in, in the financial sector that really determines, um, you know, our, um, our, our pathway on this. Uh, governments will have an influence, but finance has to make the decisions and move the money. Um, and, and so, and, and, part, and as part of this, we know that we can't burn all of the fossil fuels that we've got available. Um, so there's this, there's this concept called the carbon bubble, um, which is basically where um, we now know that we just can't burn all of the fossil fuels that are currently in the ground. Now, a lot of those fossil fuels are owned by companies right now. Um, so we're in a situation where we've got companies that have these assets, uh, the, you know, all these oil and gas reserves, that, that you know, if, if humanity is to survive, cannot be extracted. These are called stranded assets. Um, 
so we got a situation where um, you know, and the question comes like, well, well you know, why, why would anyone want to invest in these oil and gas companies then if, if a big portion of their, um, of their investments are, 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 are not worth anything in the long run? Um, but then, you know, even, even with that, with the knowledge of both the climate crisis and the, the, the very short sort of basic financial idea that, that we have this carbon bubble, we, we find that the finance industry is still pouring billions, hundreds of billions of dollars every year into oil and gas and actually uh, way more than into renewables. Um, now, I, I've taken these numbers. These are like pre-coronavirus numbers. Things will have changed. Um, but I think it's really important to, 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 to keep uh, in mind that with the financial system, you know, this is the course it was on. And uh, when we get out of the crisis, it will do everything to return to that business as usual. So we, we've got to be really active, uh, active in challenging it. And what you were saying um, before, uh, you, we're, what we're trying to sort of get across, I suppose, is the insanity that's um, kind of inherent in the financial system at the moment and, and, and has been for quite a while. And you said earlier that, that the financial uh, system has a responsibility to save us and society. But if, it's almost insane on both of those fronts because savers are not going to get a return on their investments either through the climate crisis because of the destruction of the planet and also the responsibility um, is also being discarded because obviously they're investing in things that are destroying us so on both those fronts they're kind of not really fulfilling their obligations it seems to me yeah yeah it's so so it's funny i um you know a couple a couple days um uh, a couple of days after I first got into the the sort of the the true reality, I really started taking in kind of emotionally what's going on with climate. I actually woke up a few days in the morning in a cold sweat. And I was like, oh my God, all, 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 the, all the investments aren't worth what they're supposed to be worth. Yeah. Um, and and then, you know, I spent months talking to peers in my industry and, and saying, well, okay, how do you feel about climate? What, what is it? What's, what is it? You know, how does it affect how you think about investing? And it's really amazing how many people who are like really smart, really clever people, they just kind of didn't want to deal with it. They're very strange. It's like, it's basically, I think, the psychology of denial. Um, and and it's really, uh, it really affects the way that the investments happen because ultimately financial market is all psychology. People invest in what they perceive to have value. So as long as the individuals that are making all these decisions uh, are in denial, it, it won't work. And then obviously there's just such massive vested interests that are trying to uh, obviously keep the system the way it is. Mm. So on the, how the financial system affects individuals, I suppose as well. Like, I, I, I mean, as, as an, as an individual, um, you know, like I'm a self-employed electrician um, three weeks ago, nearly I was, pretty much told that I couldn't go to work and I couldn't earn any money and um, I didn't have an income. Um, I was told that, um, you know, um, by the banks and stuff that I had um, loans and credit cards with that basically not to get in touch with them because they were going to be so busy um, and that um, they were coming up with plans to basically um, help people, etc., etc. Um, so I didn't get in touch with the bank. After about 10 days, I got an email from them saying that they were cancelling like overdraft payments. Um, but, I, you know, I didn't get any information about credit card or, or loan repayments. So um, a few days ago, I had to actually phone the bank up um, because my payment for my loan was due to go out on the, on the 20th of March, which, which is today, actually. When I rang the bank up, they said because I was within seven days of the payment going out, which was the 20th, that um, I could no longer um, defer that payment. So that payment of £250 had to go out, and the payment holiday on, on the loans and, and the credit card, etc., could only happen um, for the three months after that. So, I mean you know, I'm in a position where I haven't got much money. I don't know when I'm going to be able to go back to work again. And, and the bank still thinks that it's acceptable to kind of take the last sort of like remaining money out of my account. Um, you know, 
and and it just felt you know really deeply unfair and i and i think lots of thousands hundreds of thousands of people are having this same problem with different financial institutions up and down the country um yeah so it kind of like highlighted the, how unfair the, the system is at, at the moment with regards to the covid crisis and and, and what, what what you think about that yeah yeah i mean it's it's it's, it's a really difficult position to be in um and I, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because like when you're on the side of the, you know, the kind of the, the financial institution, you work in finance, you, you know, the, you, you, you deal with all these investments and you sort of see it as like numbers on a page and it just becomes like your job. But then it's like, when you have an experience like this, it's very clear that it's like there's people on the other side of that and something's going wrong in the system where it's somehow like too easy to just like, I guess like dehumanize people to just be like, oh well, you know, you're you're you came up on the spreadsheet and you've got to pay. Um, so so yeah, it's I, I, yeah, I think there's a problem with it. It's it, it's not designed really to to take into account like people and and their very kind of human needs. I saw, for instance, the other day, like um, a, a pub landlord has been billed eight thousand pounds for for rent from his pub, for which had been shut down from the government for the last month. But the but the um, brewery is still charging the landlord eight thousand pounds rent. There's kind of like this idea that um, yeah, the whole system is kind of like addicted to growth and debt, and the whole system kind of runs on that. Um, and 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 this is it. the COVID crisis is is showing that up. But that's also true with regards to the climate crisis. It's addicted to growth and debt, and and that's causing problems. Um, to our environment and our planet, um, that, 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 that these two problems are, are, are linked. There's like a subtle link in there, I suppose, isn't there? Yeah, no, no. I think I think it's you know increasingly not a subtle link. Um, yeah. Um, no, but I think you know, I think I think it's a really good point because I think basically what you're doing is like you're questioning this like basic assumption that we have, which is that like you know if I'm a landlord and I've got a tenant. I have a right to take my rent from that tenant no matter what, you know, or if I'm a bank and I've got a debt, I've got a right to take that debt no, no matter what. Um, and, and I think, I think, I think we're in a really interesting moment now where it's like, that's all being questioned. Um, and um, uh, yeah. And, and I think, I, th I think you're, um, I think you're also really, uh, you know, this, this idea of like being addicted to growth and debt. Um, it's, it's, really interesting when you look throughout the financial system um, you, you see how at every point in the system it's like it's like a machine which has been turned up to the like the absolute maximum it can and so everything's running on these like really thin fine margins of like to grow basically grow as quickly as you can and and the way that you grow um, is you take on investment you borrow um, but, but then what that does is, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if, uh, if you're buying a house or something, you know, the more you borrow, the more you're at risk um, of, of if, if, the, if the situation gets worse, that, that you're going to be in a bad situation. And I think that's what we're seeing now is um, we, we're seeing how we've got an economy where, where so many companies are so burdened with debt um, that as soon as there's a downturn, they're immediately going bankrupt and then coming to the taxpayer to say, or well, can, you know, can, can we have money? Um, but, but the, you know, there's almost like, it's almost like this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not like a surprise, right? Like there are things that go wrong in the economy. There are going to be crises. And so the fact that our financial system allowed us to get into a place where we were so unprepared is really, is, is really criminal. Mm -hmm. And, and then, the, the, then we are all going to have to pay for it crisis like this it really shows up the heartlessness as well of the society the lack of like any kind of compassion um and i think that's really going to be highlighted especially over the next few weeks and months when people talk about the financial industry it often feels very opaque like there's no you know it just feels like it's um very corporatist and um it, it feels like you can't really get into it in any way so where does the responsibility actually lie do you think yeah so I, th I i personally think this is one of the most important questions that never gets asked um which is oh thank you very much really, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's really important because 
you, you, you can't uh, engage in something, you can't hold it to account if, if, if you don't, you can't see it for what it really is. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is explain the financial system in one diagram. And uh, let's, let's see how it goes. This is a financial system. Um, and, and I've broken it up into the main elements. And the reason I've done this is because it will explain the, the places where actually the real power lies. Um, so uh, I think the best analogy almost for, for it is almost like, uh, like a river, right? That, that, that's flowing from the mountain where there's, where there's a source and it goes and it ends up in the sea. Um, and, and it's very much like a flow of water. So what you have on the left-hand side, you've got uh, what are called asset owners. So these are, are the institutions and the individuals that are the ultimately hold the wealth, that are ultimately the people that actually sort of own the money, so to speak. Um, and, and there's three types of institutions that, that do that. Um, the biggest is pension funds. Um, then there's insurance companies, um, which, uh, which have quite a lot of money that they just keep because they uh, keep your insurance premiums and then they invest it because they're going to have to pay out sometime in the future, maybe. And then there's very wealthy individuals um, who, who, who also take part in the system. Um, and, um, and these institutions, they've got money and their job is to, is to basically grow that, grow that uh, savings part uh, in the long run. A pension fund's got to do that because they want to pay out pension contributions over 50, 100 years. So th 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 this is where it all starts. But then what they, they need to take that money and they need to invest it into, com into companies, basically. Um, and that's what we call the real economy. So that's actual businesses, that's infrastructure, that's, that's anything sort of that's actually doing something. Um, so so these, these investors, they want to get the money into the real economy. But what's, what's happened, in, you know, especially in, 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 the, in the last 30 years, is we've seen a massive growth in this bit in the middle which is the asset management industry. So this is going to be companies like BlackRock that you've heard of or Vanguard or Hargreaves Lansdowne in the UK. Um, so what these companies do is, is they actually act as like middlemen. They, uh, they, they just uh, move the money for the asset owners. Um, and then there's also banks. Um, and it gets very con convoluted because the, the banks are actually ultimately owned by the asset owners and the asset managers, uh, which are the shareholders in the banks. Um, and wh why this is important is because um, uh, basically, a it's really diffuse. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, uh, individual decision makers. It's not like government where you have got the prime minister. It's really obvious who to hold to account. Um, but if you do want to understand where the power is, you need to follow the money. And the money starts right at the top of the channel in the in these uh, pension funds and um, and other asset owners. And so these people, they actually have the power to determine what happens in the rest of the system. Um, and, and, you know, part, part of the problem is I think we, we spend a lot of time focusing on the, um, the really high profile companies, like, for example, the Black Rocks of the world. But actually, these guys, these guys are, are the source of the problem and not necessarily the, the solution, because what they, they operate a bit like Tesco and Sainsbury's, where they're just middlemen. They're just trying to basically fill the shelves up and basically they're competing with each other to do the financial equivalent of selling a pint of milk for the lowest price. Um, so they all, all they do is basically just try and make these investment products and sell them, um, and and the competition between them is is a lot of what's driven the short termism in the financial industry right now, because they're all competing to show that they can give the most profits just to attract more money. Um, so so we've got this situation where um, uh, we've got these asset owners at the top. We've got all this ultimately power in the industry, but they're not in the in the limelight. They're very you know. When's the last time you heard a protest at a pension company? <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't a lot of them. And yeah. ultimately, they're investing our money, right? So, so we're in this perverse situation where um, pension funds are investing everyone's money in an economy that is going to destroy the world that they live in and, and, is, and is wreaking all sorts of damage to our society. Um, so, so, so that's sort of a, a in a broad sense of, of, of how the, the industry works. But then the other thing I was, I'll point out is that actually each of these institutions, they, there are people responsible within them. So most financial institutions have a board of director, a board of directors of about 10 people um, who look something like, look something like this. Um, 
they're, they're, they're you know they're, they're they're good people they've got kids grandchildren they want um they want them to have a good world to live in um and um and, and there's actually if you think about it probably a couple hundred companies that control most of the money in, in the uk and and there's only you know around 10 directors for each one so there's actually not that many people if you can find them who uh, who are actually making the decisions in this system what we've seen over the last kind of like 30 40 years is a is a real um depoliticization of 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 money we've kind of like freed the markets um this kind of neoliberal policies that we've seen kind of like all, all over the world really for the past 30 40 years which is kind of like basically summed up by privatization deregulation and kind of cuts in in social spending and 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 it's been kind of fueled by this idea of like depoliticizing money that we should let the markets kind of like do their work for us kind of thing um what i suppose what i wanted to ask is um first of all how does that affect us which i think you've you've, you've spoken about already in some ways um how yeah how does that affect us and, and why what, why does that matter and uh, you know what, what how how should maybe we try and change that it's fascinating and and, and when, when we were preparing this i remember i remember you put this question in about like okay well what, what about the kind of politicization of the financial sector and and it, it you know and, and it just reminded me how much when you're inside the system um you you really um you you, you really get trained to think that that you know that there's nothing to question here, right? We all just get to do our, we, we all just do our job. And as long as everyone plays by the rules um, uh, as a financial system, then, you know, we don't have any responsibility for the outcome. Um, and I think that's really, um, I think that's really toxic and really dangerous um, uh, because because ultimately what what will happen then is you'll just, the financial system will just run on um, and, and, and with each person individually doing what they think is the right thing, we'll end up in a terrible outcome just because of the way it's structured. Um, so I think, I think one of the most powerful things that XR can do is to like raise this question of like, of like, well, actually, what should the financial system look like? What economy do we want? And not just assuming that we're going to have the same, you know, uh, growth focused, you know, high debt, um, you know, like you know, low democracy kind of economic system that we have basically been kind of uh, stuck with pretty much since like the eighties. We got a question here, which is, um, how do we mitigate power by a more ethical management of financial resources? Um, I quite like that. That's 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 quite a good question. Um, have you got Have you got any thoughts? No, go on, Vince. You're 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 the man. I'm the man. Okay. Hear what I've got to say. <laughs> um, I um, I um, how do we, yeah? I think um, I think this is uh, I think XR's thing around systems assemblies is actually really important here, um, because basically what we got right now is a system where the the people that have to um, people make the financial decisions are so far away from this from the place where those where the outcomes of those decisions are happening, um. And there's nothing, um, there's no structures or nothing that forces them to do that. Um, so I think something that could be really cool would be making it so that every financial institution had to hold an assembly with everyone that was affected by their investments, right? So that could be like, uh, you know, the customers, that could be the employees, it could be communities in the places that are affected by it. And if they just had to like hear those people um, before they made the decisions, I think you would have a much, I think it would really change things. We, we've got an incendiary one. Um, so, so this person says, who cares about returns to, returns to savers? They are, by definition, the 1%, the capital owner class. Traditionally, like um, somebody like my, in my, my, my grandmother and granddad, they, they, you know, they worked for 34 years and, and they saved. Um, I think, I think the, the, like I was saying, I think that neoliberal kind of like system over the last 20, 20, 30, 40 years is like really affected like people's ability to save, uh, anymore. I think the idea of saving is a good, is a good idea. I think it'd be, it'd be nice if we could, 
could save more. But you know, I, I don't know. It's an interesting. It's an interesting point. I don't think there are. I don't think there are. I don't know how many people. What the percentage of people are that are savers in the UK anymore? I think it's pretty small these days. Is it? Is it not? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know the statistics. I mean, I, th- I think it's an interesting point um, because I think we do have a situation where we definitely like have like the haves and the have nots and that's like, you know, uh, greater than it ever has been. And, and, and the relationship between the two is, is, is increasingly toxic and strained as we're seeing right now. Um, but I think for me, my like hope, and I've always, I've always liked this sort of XR principle, like no blaming and shaming even though it's sometimes really hard. <laughs> um, uh, like, is there a way that we can kind of get through this without like needing a kind of like a kind of <laughs> like, like a sort of a, a bloody overthrowing and, and, and that like, you know, everyone can see their, their part in it. Um, and, and I think that includes people with, who, have, who, have, who have money. Um, they've got a part to play in this, I think. Um, all right, I've got, I've got another question here. So re- I think a really good question. Um, how is someone who relies on their job um, and needs money to provide for a family meant to rebel against an economic system that provides so much for us? This is like a really interesting question. I mean, even like somebody like myself, who's like, I mean, I go to work, but I mean, I'm single, no kids. And even myself, I face that battle, um, uh, you know, between providing for for myself and looking after myself and being responsible and having this idea of like uh, going into activism um so i think so one of the ideas that i mean we're going to i think in in money talks week we're going to talk a lot more about what xr can and, and cannot do um with regards to like activism i suppose within this industry but one of the kind of ideas that i've been thinking about is so within the debt strike is um, there's quite an interesting campaign going on at the moment um, to target Amazon where every where they're trying to get people to cancel their Amazon Prime account. But basically the idea is, is that nobody cancels it until you have a million people signed up to the campaign. So, you, you know, you don't, you don't um, cancel until then. And I think this idea it seems like a mountain and, and it seems like fantastical in a way, but you know, um, the, sometimes in activism, we have to have that idea of the practical is irrelevant. We just need to do it because it's right. Is that, you know, with regards to debt, maybe we, you know, you get, you get um, that you're going to um, default on your debts um, that you're prepared to do it, but you're not going to do it until maybe hundred thousand people or, 200,000 people or maybe half a million people we all agree to do it at the same time and that there's like a collective safety net through doing that and we really we cause a real um, hammer blow to to the financial industry if 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 we can kind of do that if we can kind of unify and, and come together in some way before we do it I don't know I don't know what you think about that Vince yeah, right. It's this idea of conditional commitments, isn't it? Yeah. You, you sign up, you don't actually have to do it until a certain number of people do it. Um, yeah, I think that stuff is, 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 is really interesting. And it's, I think, given the situation a lot of people in, it's going to be a much bigger issue. And the same thing is also happening with rent strikes as well. All yeah. around the world, there's people saying, well, OK, we're not going to pay our rent. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I think that there can be ways that like the rebellion you know, can, can hopefully, for, if for people who are in a situation where, where they are financially strained, they, it, it might be of some benefit. Mm. Um, all right, we, 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 we've got another good question here. There is no such thing as caring capitalism. It's not a question of ethics or, or bad or good people, um, but the bottom line, which is shareholder return. So what do you think about this? There's no such thing as caring capitalism. I think... For me, like as I say, I, I'm not a, I'm not an expert. I'm just somebody who is um, living in this system and, and trying their best to, to survive in it at times and, and trying to change it as best I can. So um, I don't always know the, the the answers to that to those questions. But um, yeah, it seems to me like um, this is kind of like. Uh, I don't always know how to explain it, but it's like 
I think this kind of like the ingenuity of human beings um, is one of our kind of greatest assets as well. And this idea of like, you know, that our entrepreneurial kind of like tendencies and the way we can create and be smart, um, it kind of in some ways seems like inherent in our nature. And it feels like that that, that is, is kind of like a quality that we should kind of like not completely try to discard um and that is definitely something that um involves like capitalism i suppose in in some sense but i do think that um yeah i think we've been confused into thinking that this kind of like idea of like heartless capitalism this um yeah this this idea of uh the rich get richer and we forget about the um the, the 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 more vulnerable parts of our society is that's definitely something that we need to completely revolutionize and change i couldn't agree more um and i think for me this is where it gets really hard because you know i spent years working with people who um you know the financial system does help the world go around and and it, it, it enables so many of the things that we that we saw sort of, you know our basic day to day um, and the people who are involved in it, like I know them personally, they're not bad people, most of them. You know, there's a few kind of Wolf of Wall Street types, but like most of them are actually, are actually all right. And they're just sort of, you know, doing, doing what they thought would be a good job. Um, but I think the people have been really disconnected from the impacts of what they're having. So I think, I think the, the financial system actually needs XR as much as XR needs a financial system, because I think we need to be brought back into connection to the kind of impact of what we're doing. I think we need to start maybe thinking about wrapping up. It's gone so quickly, isn't it? It's been really great. Um, Yeah, definitely. So that's it from us. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good rest of your evening.